the Ruthan Hartree-Fock equation, let me just quickly derive it again for continuity. So we had, we started from the canonical Hartree-Fock equation which was in space orbital. So I hope all of you can write the equation in space orbital. So let us assume that the phi i's are the space orbitals and uh, our chi's are the spin orbitals. So this is the canonical Hartree-Fock equation for in space orbitals and in particular if it is closed shell. So of course this form will depend on what kind of systems it is. So this is a particularly for closed shell you can get a single eigenvalue equation like this where f of r or f of r1 is h of r1, please remember that the, now the spin is integrated, okay. So this is only in terms of space orbital. So this is uh, the spin integrated equation for the closed shell. So h of r1 plus sum over j equal to 1 to n by 2 integral phi j star 2. 1 by R12, 2, 2 minus P12, phi J2 d tau. So I hope all of you can write this. 2 is essentially R2, just to make sure that you understand, and the integration is done over d tau 2. R12 is, of course, mod R1 minus R2. So this 2 comes, first of all, the summation is over only n by 2 special orbitals. 2 comes because of the fact that the orbit, the electron which is giving interaction can, if this is an up spin, it can be either up spin or down spin for Coulomb and for exchange it can be only parallel spin. So there is only one term. The P12 will ensure the interchange of R1 and R2 when this operator will act on the coordinate of electron 1. So when it acts on the coordinate of electron 1, it will ensure that this becomes 1 and this one will become 2. So that will bring the exchange effect which cannot be classically interpreted but otherwise everything is exactly same as the Hartree-Fock equation for spin orbitals, okay. So this is what we first did. Then we said that for molecules the exact solution of this is difficult. So one has to adopt what is called the expansion in terms of a basis. So instead of solving this equation in the coordinate space, we solve by expanding these special orbitals in terms of a basis because these are now my unknowns, the special orbitals and the basis is a set of known functions. So the unknowns will become the expansion of the coefficients. So these are basically numbers. So that is the difference. So we can write now phi i of r or r1, it does not matter, it is a dummy variable, sum over mu c mu i and a basis which is the basis usually of atomic orbitals but it need not be. So usually the basis is of at atomic orbital, the set a mu is a set of atomic orbitals. But note that this is only usually, mathematically of course it can be any complete set. Okay, but of course the chemistry dictates that if you have a set of atomic orbitals, this becomes convergent. Since you are expanding in a basis, of course there is a problem of basis set limit and usually again we cannot reach the limit unless we take infinite number of functions. But let us assume that we have taken an m basis function. So in which case the Hartree-Fock itself as an approximation has one more level of approximation that is the expansion of the basis. Is it clear? So that is what we did and then we said that this problem now which was a problem of finding a function set of n, n by 2 functions is now reduced to finding <laughs> a set of coefficients. 
because these are known functions, all right. And those coefficients are obtained by the Hartree-Fock Ruthan equation by plugging this into this equation and multiplying the equation by a member of the basis, conjugate of a member of the basis and integrating over r. So that led us to the Ruthan equation which I, I just write this first and then explain sum over mu equal to epsilon i sum over mu s nu mu c mu y, where f nu mu was a matrix element of phi nu star r <coughs> f of r phi mu r d of r d tau. So, when I do the integration, multiply by one member of the basis and integrate, the integration is of course a definite integral, so it will result in a number, that number will depend on the, the, the mu here and mu here, so we call this f nu mu and this is actually has a structure of a matrix, m by m matrix, because it is a m in number, so you have an m by m matrix. The c mu i's are very clear. They are the coefficients of expansion of the ith, what I now call molecular orbital, in terms of the muth atomic orbital. So, in a very simple chemistry notation, C mu i is the contribution of muth atomic orbital in ith molecular orbital. So, that is what this coefficient means, right? That I expand the ith molecular orbital, A mu, this is leading to this coefficient. So, this is the expansion of A mu in phi i. So, this is basically famously can be called your LCAO MO coefficients. So, if you want to track a molecular orbital, all you have to look is the ith column. Please note again, the way the symbol that is written is a standard symbol, where the molecular orbital is ex expanded in terms of a column. So, that is why it is not C i mu, but C mu i. So, if i is 1, this is 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1 up to capital M1. So, the first column will give you the expansion of first molecular orbital in terms of the M AO, second column will give you expansion of second molecular orbital and so on. So, that is a standard notation. So, please remember it is used in all Hartree Fock programs and this is the standard notation. You can of course do, do it the other way around the row wise, but this is the standard notation. So, C mu i's are the coefficients. S nu mu is similarly an overlap integral between phi mu star r, phi nu r, d tau and d tau and if there is, these are not orthonormal, of course, the S nu mu will not be z, delta. So, provided of course, they are orthonormal, this will become a delta nu mu, chronic delta, okay, which is orthonormal set, but in general they are not. So, the equation that you get is of this form and which you have derived, it is very, it is very easy to do this, just expand this, integrate by phi mu star, a mu star, oh sorry, sorry, I think there is a mistake, yeah, I think you should have pointed out, the, these are all a, these are expanded in terms of the basis, a mu star, a mu, a mu star, So, when I, when I expand this in terms of the atomic orbital basis and multiply by a nu star, then obviously you will get a nu star f of r mu r, so not the phi, phi is no longer there, okay. So, these are all in terms of the basis, okay. And c mu i is the expansion of phi i in the basis of a mu, okay. So, this is the famous Hartree Fock Ruthan equation, okay. We have to solve this equation. Clearly, clearly, if and this is something that you should recognize. If S nu mu were delta nu mu, which means if the basis were orthonormal, okay, you could see that this equation would have become F nu mu C mu y, and here you would have got nu equal to mu, so it would have become epsilon i C nu y for a specific nu. A new is specific, you are summing over mu, and this would actually have been what, you, what I would call now eigenvalue equation. 
So all of you know that this is in the structure of an eigenvalue equation. So this would have reduced to an eigenvalue equation provided s mu nu were delta nu mu, but in general they are not. So we must recognize that in gen this is not a general form, this is the general form of the Ruthan equation. Clearly then our next task is to find out the C mu y and to do that you have to write F nu mu in greater details by going to this equation, integrating, writing this in terms of the coefficients. Quite clearly if you notice that since F depends on the orbitals, when I expand these orbitals the capital F nu mu will also depend on the coefficients and this is where the whole self consistent field structure which was there would again come back here because F will depend on the coefficients. So whichever way you solve the equations you have to solve iteratively. So there are two problems, one is of course the iterative problem which is already half that is not vanishing that is there it is only that the iterative solution will now be in the coefficients but a further problem that is coming is how do you solve this equation? So how to solve because it is no longer eigenvalue equation. So both there are apart from this there is a second level of problem that we have now encountered since it is not an eigenvalue equation. So how do I solve the eigenvalue equation? Okay, so we will come to that later but right now I hope all of you should be able to write F nu mu. So F nu mu is if you start with this it will be integral A nu star r or r1 h of, see please remember that whether I am writing r or r1 it does not matter because that is an integral which is integrated over the element. So this is just a dummy variable. I am writing r1 here specifically because I have to bring in r2. So it is easy to see 1 and 2. If I write that r then if I call that r1 then it is more difficult to write this. I have to specifically write r minus r1 modulus r minus r1. So I am just avoiding doing that. So whenever I require I am writing this r1 but it does not matter because that is a dummy variable. So a mu r1 data 1. So that is the first term. Now note that this can be trivially integrated because I know the operator h of r1. These are my known basis functions so I can integrate. But whichever integration may be very complex, mathematically complex but this is doable. Then the second term comes from here. The second terms are more complicated because you have a sum over j 1 to n by 2 first and then there is an integration over d tau 2 and there is a further integration over d tau 1. Please remember I am eventually doing an integration over d tau 1 right that is my f, f nu mu but in the definition of f of r1 there is another integration over d tau 2. I hope you can see that right. So eventually there will be double integration. So let me write it down carefully. First I write a nu star r1 okay which is just comes here because I, I want to write this as a nu star f of r. That instead of r now I am using r1 that is all this is dummy variable. And there is a sum over j which I have just deliberately taken outside. Then I have a phi j star r2. So I have to write phi j star r2 again as a expansion in terms of the basis. So the same expansion I am going to use now for phi j star. So I hope you can expand this phi j. So let us use different dummy variable. All you have to do is to be careful about dummy variables. So I cannot use mu and nu. They are already taken. So I must use something else. So let us say I write phi j as sum over lambda c lambda j just I am writing it on the sideline l, l sorry c lambda j a lambda right. So I just wrote it in the sideline so that it becomes very easy whether it is r1, r2 that depends on what is there. So I have now have to do phi j star r2. So I have to write this as a lambda star r2 right correct and of course there is a c lambda j. So c lambda j star let me write it here outside the integration because that is a number. So that comes outside the integration then you have 1 by r12. And I will keep using the abstract form for the time being 2 minus p12, okay. And then let me integrate the d tau 2 by putting in another phi j. 
remember this is again a phi j, but I can't use the same dummy variable. I must use another dummy variable, let us say sigma. So, I put the sum over lambda of course, has already come and then I have a sum over sigma, okay. So, C sigma j, or C sigma j is already written. So, A sigma of R p, right. So, I am expanding this in terms of sigma, this phi j R p, okay. So, I have a C sigma j which I have written outside the integration and A sigma R 2 and of course, I must complete, complete this by bringing in A mu R 1, right, A mu R 1 and now I have data 1 dita 2 first and then dita 1. Is it clear? I hope all of you can write this. Yes, yes. So, summation over lambda sigma, summation over j, c lambda j star, c sigma j and this integration. Now, if you look at this entire equation, they are all numbers because the first term is a number of course. The second term is also a number now because it is a total integration of dita 2 and dita 1. Unlike here, where there is a partial integration of a dita 2, it has a both the integration and which is expected because from this partial integration, I did a further integration of dita 1 or dita whatever. So, obviously, this should become a number and I get a very compact form of what I call f nu mu, okay. Out of which this is trivial. But now this is where the problem will come because to define f nu mu nu nu mu you can see that I require the coefficients, okay. So that is the reason again you have to do an iterative or self-consistent field solution. So instead of guessing the phi, I have to guess the coefficients because these are my unknowns, not the phi because these are known and then I have to construct the Fock matrix and then somehow solve this equation which I will come later how to solve. So, let us not worry right now. Let us say I solve this equation, get the coefficients, reconstruct the Fock matrix and keep doing till it converges, okay. So, that will be my strategy now. So, instead of strategy of converging on phi, I am going to converge on coefficients. Now, there are several questions. What do you mean by convergence? When do I say it is converged? All that I will discuss when we go into more details. But philosophically, that is going to be the strategy now. So, basically guess the coefficients, guess the coefficients C mu y matrix, then construct the Fock matrix, solve Ruthan equation, right, get a new set of coefficients. Let us say I call it, so let us say I start with some n, I call this n plus 1, n is number of iteration, okay. So, it is mathematically I am just writing n plus 1 and then go back and construct the Ruthan equation again, a f again and keep solving till it converges. So, it comes out at the convergence point which I will discuss how do you converge. But philosophically that would become your mathematical way of solving this. So, reconstruct after the coefficient the Fock matrix, solve this equation Ruthan equation again, keep doing when the coefficients converge and what do we mean by convergence we will discuss later. But there are several things to discuss before that. One is to first of all look at this equation very carefully, the Fock matrix equation very carefully, then to see how to solve it, this equation because as I said, they are not orthonormal, okay. So, it is not an eigenvalue equation. So, we, we will have to do uh, piece by piece. So, let us look at this part little bit more carefully. The part of the F nu mu which includes the the two electron integration. But before that, let me write down the first part. Just as I wrote f nu mu, I can now define integral a nu star r1 or r does not matter, h of r1, a mu of r1. That is the easy part and that is very often called the h core, sorry, h core nu mu. It is again a matrix element right, depending on the 
basis nu and mu and this is very often called the H core. Now, we, now I am using actually capital H, but please remember this is not a Hamiltonian, full Hamiltonian, it is just the one electron part and it is very often written as capital now and with a core on the superspeed. The core essentially means that it is the one electron part, the kinetic energy in the electron nuclear attraction. So that is all, the core has no other meaning. So basically it means the one electron part. Somehow it is traditionally written with a capital H. I could have written a small h just to continue that, but that's, that should not bother you, okay? So this is what I define, the, d tau, d tau 1 of course. This is uh, <coughs> the first part of the F mu, okay? Then the second part, before I come to the second part, I must remember that there is a P12 here, of course. So there is a Coulomb and exchange part. So that, of course, I should not forget. So the Coulomb part and exchange part both involves integration of this kind, A nu star R1. So let me write those integral first, A lambda star R2, some one of the typical integral. Do not worry about the 2 minus P12, but what is important is 1 by R12. So let me write down those integral, A sigma R2 and A nu mu R1, d tau 2, d tau 1. This is the typical form of the integral that I must first understand because after that it is only a question of multiplication of 2. And when I exchange 1, 2, it just exchanges these two. But that does not harm and that, that, is, that is only index change in this case. So this is what is called the two electron integrals. And the H core, just as, just as I written this, these are called one electron integrals. Of course, it is very easy to understand why they are one electron and they are two electron. One electron integrals, of course, involves the kinetic energy plus the electron nuclear attraction. The two electron is just the two electron integrals and that is very important to understand. These integrals, of course, during the SCF process have to be calculated only once because you can imagine that the basis sets are known, functions are known. So I just calculate once. The iteration comes because they will be multiplied by these coefficients, all right? But these integrals per se has to be evaluated only once. So these integrals are very important. They are, they have a nu and lambda on one side, sigma and mu on the another side. So just as we have been doing the Dirac notation, I can write this integral in Dirac notation as nu lambda, right? 1 by R12 sigma mu, or sorry, mu sigma, okay? By the Dirac notation, it is a 1, 2, 1, 2 notation. So, so I just want to tell you again, just as we did for the, for the IJKL in spin orbital, space orbital, I am going to use a simple notation like this to write the full integral. So I am not going to write the full notation, okay? So then I, I should be able to write this part of the Fock matrix very quickly. So then I can write this Fock matrix now, F nu mu as H core nu mu plus lambda sigma sum over J C lambda J star C sigma J, okay? So this part I bring in and now I write the integral. So the integral will be, first integral will be nu lambda. 1 by R12 mu sigma. However, multiplied by 2, okay? Because you have 2 times this, okay? Minus, so let me write this over with the bracket, minus the, the term which is comes with only 1, but there is a P12, so it will only exchange the right side. So now it will look like nu lambda 1 by R12 sigma mu, that is it. So your Fock matrix is now written, correct? 
and you can actually now construct the entire Fock matrix because these are now numbers, everything is numbers. So that is why we say in high performance computing, despite the fact that everything was a function of R dependent, finally everything becomes a number, it's just manipulation of numbers, matrices and numbers, so it becomes very easy, but big, big numbers because remember these are no longer depends on number of electrons, this dimension depends on the capital M, right? You remember my phi i's for phi j's were expanded in a basis and the basis I said should be as complete as possible. Even though my number of electrons may be 2, 4, 10, whatever, my basis has to be very large. So the capital M was much larger than capital N. So these are basically m to the power 4 in number 1 m, 2 m, 3 m, 4 m. So m into m into m into m, 4 m to the power 4. And you can imagine per se, these integrals are very large. Of course, these are not any separate integrals. Remember, these integrals and these integrals are same. It just subset is different, okay, instead of, so it's m to the power 4. I don't have, m to the power 4 is a really very large number. You can see very quickly. Typically today, if you use a basis of 100, you can imagine what is 100 to the power 4. We are talking of, you know, 100 million. And, and later on I will mention this is the problem of high performance computing. So a lot of good computer science people can help us. They know how to do really. So lot, there's a, those who are doing programming, coding, they can be actually, they, are, they take a lot of interest because they have interest in computer science. You know, many of them are just good coders you know, and, and good algorithms, matrix eigenvalue equation involving large numbers. Eventually you are forming an M by a matrix, <coughs> remember, <coughs> using data which are m to the power 4, the, some summations are there, okay? And there is a summation over j of course which is 1 to n by 2, let me mention this and this is, these are m, 1 to m, so just to understand because these are only over the molecular orbitals, so they are n by 2 and that is where the SCF part will come, the coefficients, okay? So they are molecular orbital, but these numbers are actually called m to the power 4. And, and something that can be quite, you know, difficult to handle if you do not do it properly. Fortunately, and I will come later on the computation part, many of these integrals are many times 0, fortunately, because of either symmetry in the molecule, depending on how you choose your basis. If you cleverly choose your basis, you can make many of them 0. And that is where group theory is very helpful. You know, those who have done group theory course would actually appreciate that this is also basically, these bases have to be some kind of symmetry functions of 1 by R12 and then it can be 0. So although they are m to the power 4 in number, they are sparse. I hope all of you have heard the word sparse, sparse matrix means it is a matrix but most of them are 0. There are very few non-zero. So this is called sparse matrix. So maybe typically for a very symmetric molecule, only 3 to 4 percent may be non-zero. It can be that sparse, okay? So the, you, have to be, you have to be clever in not unnecessarily playing with zeros because you can, you can keep on multiplying. You will see that you have to multiply these times these. So what is the point in multiplying zero and wasting computer time? So instead, you have to be clever in picking up only non-zero elements and then doing the summation. Now that is another issue that we will not discuss today, how to do the summation. Because if you, if you drive by the loop lambda sigma, then quite clearly many zeros will come unnecessarily and will keep, keep multiplying. On the other hand, what is done is what is called integral driven programs where you take only non-zero integrals and then do the multiplication. But then the question is how do you multiply? because you do not have loops here. So you look at what are the values, they also store not only non-zero values, but they also store these indices only for those non-zero values. Once I fetch the indices, I know where it will go. So you know, it is like a table, table. it is very easy to do. Uh, if you are of course, if you have ever done programming, you realize that it is a, you know, it is something that the computer science people, if you just tell them, they will be excited. So it's very exciting actually, the programming part itself is very exciting, but remember you can't do have a loop driven program, 
that is wasting the time because too much, too many things are 0. So, they do what is called integral driven programs, non-zero integral driven programs. So, you only say, you only store non-zero integrals and drive the entire program only through them. So, that is a strategy that we will not discuss today, but I just thought I will tell you. 